Hi, welcome to another edition of Behind the Mask. Behind the Mask is really the goal of just kind of getting to know the leaders that we have in healthcare and especially on the clinical side a little bit deeper. There are some great podcasts and other media out there that really highlights many of the same leaders, but really talking more about what they're doing in the workplace and, and the success that they've had helping transform. But this is really on a more personal level, so you can connect a little bit better. And so today's guest is Margaret. And so Margaret, I want to welcome you to Behind the Mask. Thank you for having me, Ed. And so Margaret, you're the SVP and Chief Health Informatics Officer at Novant Health. Correct. Yeah. So for, before we jump in to the three broad areas, which are really about who are you, how did you get there, and where are you going, can you tell us briefly about yourself and your organization? Yes, absolutely. So um, I am a general pediatrician. I see patients in the hospital, so I'm a pediatric hospitalist. And as you said, I'm the chief health informatics officer. Um, I have oversight for all the informatics teams at our system at Novant Health. We are a 17 hospital and about 800 clinic system in North and South Carolina. And I have the pleasure of leading all of our informatics teams. So that includes physicians, nurses, and other clinical informaticists. And you're just a great person. We've connected a couple of times. You're a great human being. And, and so I'm so glad that we could have you on Behind the Mask. So at what age did you know, obviously you're a leader. At what age did you know you were a leader? Was there this aha moment or how did that happen? That's a great question. Um, I feel like I've always taken on leadership roles from a very young age. My mom describes that in daycare, I would always be leading all the other children. It sort of just came naturally to me. The times in my life that I remember where it came up in conversation is really through the elementary school years. I would often find myself leading conversations with kids congregated around me, and uh, my family actually immigrated to the U.S. when I was nine, and we spent some time through uh, the process of immigration in Europe. And during those times, I often remember that all the adults would come to me asking for directions, where to find things. And so all of those stories, as I reflected on that question, are really great examples of leadership in my personal life through my childhood. And so, Margaret, where did you come from and out of Europe when you immigrated? I was born in Minsk, Belarus, and we came to the U.S. as refugees. And so we went through that whole process uh, through the refugee camps and such uh, in Austria and Italy. Very cool. I did not know that. That is that is pretty awesome. Some other time, I'd love to chat more with you about that. Um, what's one thing your parents forced you to do growing up that at the time you were like, oh, I don't want to be doing this. Uh, but now that you're an adult, you're like, I'm glad they did that. So I know exactly <laughs> what that was when I think about what my parents forced me to do. My parents always recognized the value of education. And so they were very diligent in forcing me to do all of my schoolwork very carefully. And when we moved to the US, my father felt very strongly that I needed to learn English as soon as possible, which I think is fair. I <laughs> was in fourth grade and um, he actually forced me to translate all my textbooks. And I, at the time I thought it was the worst homework yeah. assignment anyone could ever ask for and then we had to sit down and I had to read it to him in Russian and at the time I thought it was horrible but as I reflect back on that it really was a great example of teaching someone to work hard to learn things quickly and I to this day I feel like rely on my knowledge of the language uh, based on what I did at that time so I am grateful that he forced me to do that and are, are you still fluent in uh but what it was we what would be the language Belarus or Russian? Um, so they do speak both Russian and Belarusian, but I speak Russian. And yes, I am so fluent. We actually taught our children to speak Russian, so they are fluent as well. Very, very cool. Love that. What was the single biggest reason you chose to become a physician? So when I was a kid, and again, being an immigrant in this country, I got exposed to healthcare very early because we came here with my extended family. And of course, with all the health issues, I found myself being the interpreter in the hospitals, in the clinics. And, and I saw that there was a lot of opportunity 
for patient care. I was exposed to some of the inequities that we talk about today in my personal life very early. And so that was really what prompted me to look into a career in medicine. And what age was that? Well, approximately what age? I would say th from elementary age to high school. Um, when I was in high school, my father actually was diagnosed with cancer and I was exposed to so much of his care and all of the challenges we had with the language. A lot of times the doctors wouldn't listen to him, wouldn't talk to him directly. And so those experiences as I was navigating the healthcare system as a child, as a teenager, I mean, over the course of yeah. those years, really made me very passionate about this field. Yeah. Wow. It's quite a story. What's one thing, Margaret, that you can share with us that perhaps the majority or none of your coworkers may know about you? So it's funny. I, um, I rarely discuss uh, personal things at work. Um, very recently, our CEO at Novant Health um, asked to interview me at a town hall for the entire system. And so I feel like a lot of personal things about me are well known. The one thing that, um, funny enough, is often not recognized because we live in the Zoom world, people don't really know what folks look like from here down. And so <laughs> I always tell the story, but every time I meet folks in person, I see the shock on their face because you've met me, you know, I'm not super tall. And so <laughs> my favorite line is when people meet me and they don't know what my height is, I always say, I know I'm taller than you expected and we all have a good laugh. <laughs> that's clever um what is your defining moment was there something that happened in your life and, and maybe you already shared it with being an immigrant but was there a defining moment or a catalyst that reinforced or or gave you a new trajectory or changed your destiny you know i think from a career perspective, I sort of followed the typical course, you know, college, medical school, all those things. When I think about a defining moment, I would actually say that um, it was meeting my husband. And funny enough, um, I really do think that that changed, of course, my personal life for obvious reasons, but it also changed my career trajectory because it was such a change in my life with having such a thoughtful, supportive partner. And uh, he's really, I always tell him, he's the reason I'm able to do this. So throughout my career, um, we met when I had just finished residency. So now almost 14 years ago, um, he has just supported me in every possible way. He's always a sounding board. We have three kids. He supported me through all of that. We've moved across the country four times. He has been there through it all. I would not have ever accomplished what I have if it wasn't for him. Oh, that's great. That, that's very kind. Yeah. It's, uh, he sounds like a great, a great person. Love to meet him someday. So yeah, that's a little bit about who you are. We're going to sort of transition about how you got here and, and it, it's all blended a little bit, but I'd like to ask you like, what, when's the last time that you cried, like got, got emotional about something? Folks that know me know that I don't get emotional very often, particularly not in the professional setting. Um, the last time that I cried was in response to some of the current events that are happening. That is really tough to watch and is very emotional for me. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt about that. Was there ever something that you really wanted uh, but didn't get? So this could be personal or professional, however you want to answer. Well, so I'll share with you a professional story. And I think it's always important for leaders to share these kinds of stories because it often feels when you see somebody in the position that they are, that they've just had an easy route to getting where they got to. And it's not always like that. Um, when I was going through training um, in my residency, I, um, like I said, I'm a pediatrician. I, at the time, really wanted to do pediatric oncology. And um I had worked at camps my whole life. I was so attached to these kids with complex needs, and I really felt like that was my calling. And so I did all of this research work with oncology folks at my institution, and they were starting a fellowship. And so there was a spot that was promised to me, and um, I was very much counting on that. So I got through the end of my third year. It was actually May of my third year. And as you might, as you probably know, July is when um, yeah. Yeah. Happens, um, where the fellowship didn't get accredited. Mm. And so there I was 
with a month left of my residency with no plan. Wow. And I was incredibly disappointed at the time. Um, but as I always say, things happen for a reason. And I ended up interviewing for what I thought was a moonlighting job for a hospital, a pediatric hospital job. And I actually told the person interviewing me that I'm not going to be here long. And <laughs> I was there for seven years. Um, but what that um, actually opened up is a path to informatics, which I didn't know was going to be the path I would take. And I was very disappointed at the time, but it really turned out for the best. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Certainly did. Was there a time that anyone like held you back, like almost purposefully, like in that situation, it wasn't, wasn't like someone purposely was holding you back, but have you ever run into that? And if so, what did you do? Yeah, I think we all unfortunately run into that. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of people in the, both our personal lives and professional lives that may not have our best interests at heart. Um, I'll give you one example of a time that I think it was pretty blatant where that was happening. I think there are times where folks feel insecure in their own roles. And so there becomes this competitive environment and it's ugly and uncomfortable. And so I was in a position like that pretty early in my career where it was a peer of mine that would really do a lot of very obvious things to undermine my credibility in very public settings. He would take many of my ideas and present them as his own. And I will tell you, at the time, I was really frustrated. I mean, it is hard when you're just starting out and trying to prove yourself. And I spoke with a mentor of mine who said to me, and I, I hold those words to my heart to this day. He said, look, it is not about credit. It, the reason people take others' ideas and present them as their, as their own is because they don't have any of their own and it's their own insecurity. It's not about you. And I think that was really, really great advice. And so what I did is I continued to do my work and continued to make sure that I hold true to my own integrity and that I do not respond in a negative way because that will only escalate the situation. And then honestly, it worked out. I had a very successful time at that organization and I left on good terms with this yeah. individual. I may not trust this person in the future. <laughs> right. However, um, I think that's the best approach is just to continue to do the work that you're doing and put all of that ugliness aside. Yeah, that, that's great advice and um, good for your mentor. Tell me about the last time you sent a thank you card or received a thank you card. So the last thank you card I received was actually from my team. Um, a few weeks ago, they one of my teams, so one of my direct reports, held um, a retreat for his group and asked me to come and present to them. And they kindly wrote me a thank you card and gifted me a plan that I have in my office. Yeah, that's very cool. Did you ever quit something and then later regret it? So... I really could not think of an example of something that I had quit. I have to say, I'm just not one to <laughs> give up on things. <laughs> and if I would had quit something and regretted it, I probably would have gone back to it and finished. Right. It. Yeah. Sort of ten tenacious. You know, you're you're gonna you're gonna get it, whatever that you had set your mind on. Um, if you were chatting to the next generation, what's one thing that you would encourage them to relish? in the journey that maybe they would otherwise rush through. You know how life is. We like, I want to hurry up and graduate. I want to hurry up in this. But is there now that you've had, you know, a few years to, to uh, you know, mature in your organization and family and things like that, is there, what would be that one thing that you would say, hey, slow down, relish this time? And there are many things that I would tell people to relish. I think from a professional perspective, the piece that, I wish I had relished more is that time to learn. Mm. We are always looking for the next step and just enjoying the opportunity to learn before you have accountability for some of the things that you're doing, I think is really important. And then from a personal perspective, gosh, I think it's so critical to cherish the time with family, loved ones, and really to cherish the people in your life that have your best interests at heart, the people yeah. that are there for you. Sometimes we take those things for granted. And, you know, everyone talks about parenting and how 
the days are long, but the years are short. Yeah. I'm really starting to recognize that as my kids are getting older. And so I do want to take those moments to relish that. Yeah. Super, super important. As we established in the beginning, you are, you're the senior vice president for chief and chief health information officer at Novant Health. So it's a great, it's a great uh, role, great position. So this next question isn't talking about like you're leaving and what's next, but generally like when, you know, towards the end of your career, if you were to look back, like where, where do you see yourself? Like maybe running a hospital health system, Novant Health, or, or do you, what sort of ambitions do you have? It's a really good question. Um, I always tell people because I have moved around some and I have been in various roles that every time I take on a role, I say it's the last one. Yeah. <laughs> this is what I wanted to achieve. And then sometimes things come up. Um, I don't know if it's a specific ambition that I have, but what I want to make sure I accomplish in my career is that I stay true to my purpose. And that has been critical to me. I always say that what matters to me is maintaining my integrity through all of this and remembering why I do this in the first place. Yeah. For me, the North Star is the patient. It's all about helping my colleagues, and that encompasses all healthcare workers, take care of the patient. And I recognize as much as we want to continue to improve patient care, we're not going to be successful if we don't support the clinicians that are providing that care. And so that's what drives me. And no matter what happens throughout my career, that's always going to be a part of what I do. Yeah, that's cool. I predict CEO, just so I, I claim first. Okay. Um, my last question is like on the personal side now, are there, and you've got this great family, great husband. Uh, is there anything like you're taking on on the personal side, like uh, as this new goal, something that you're trying to to accomplish, whether it's like climb, you know, a mountain or whatever, learn a new skill. What, what's going on on the personal side? Well, I like to call myself the anti-athlete and anyone that knows me will recognize that. Um, but, you know, as I have thought about um, being a physician, understanding the importance of health, taking care of myself, um, we are not taught that in medical school. Hmm. In fact, we are taught to ignore all personal needs for 30 <laughs> hours straight, 80 <laughs> hours a week, as much as you possibly can. And so in the last few years, what I've really come to understand and strive for is to make sure that I am more active. So I started walking every day and it's been fantastic. I've kept it up for the last six months. Um, I also bring my kids with me. So it's been a time yeah. with them. And to me, what's critical is setting that example for them, that it is important to take care of yourself, to take care of your health from a young age and not to put that aside when we get caught up in our busy lives. Marga, that's fantastic. Not only are you a, a great person, but many of the answers that you gave, I don't know, I, I took some notes. There's probably like six or seven different things that I think our, our listeners will not only just appreciate like knowing you and who you are, but like super practical uh, advice as well at the same time. So if, it's pretty amazing. So I just want to end by saying thank you for being our guest and, and being vulnerable and authentic and sharing a little bit about yourself. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. All right. That wraps up Behind the Mask. Thanks for watching.